the Old Testament. Is it history or not? This question is a hot-blooded issue filled with personal theory and conjecture. To present an overview of the origin of the Old Testament is like venturing into a quagmire of quicksand. All sides of this debate support their theories with logical argument and archaeological discovery. I acknowledge that the minimalist academic community would mock and ridicule what I will present in this video. But I also acknowledge that the maximalist academic community might agree with the basic premise of this video. With this simple thought in mind, let's begin this overview. The Old Testament can be difficult to track because its authorship dates back to the dawn of alphabet writing. The concept of alphabet writing can be traced back to the second millennium BC in the Levant area of the Eastern Mediterranean. The actual language the earliest autographs of the Old Testament were written in is a subject for debate. But some scholars believe that these early writings were authored in the Paleo-Hebrew script. The Paleo-Hebrew alphabet came on the scene in the 10th century BC and this alphabet would be the writing script of the ancient Israelite people. The Old Testament is not one book. It is a collection of books that were assembled over several centuries. The dating of these books is the controversial part. Some conservative scholars date the earliest manuscripts such as the Pentateuch to the early Iron Age, while liberal bibliographers attempt to push the authorship of these manuscripts to the era following the return of the Hebrew nation from Babylonian captivity. Who is right? Who is wrong? The debate is still ongoing. But just remember one thing. The same academic community that cannot agree on the history of the Old Testament is the same community that theorizes the dating of the Old Testament. Flavius Josephus, a first century Jewish scholar and historian who was an eyewitness to the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD by the Romans, wrote two important historical works called The Jewish War and Antiquities of the Jews. These works provide valuable insight into first century Judaism and the background of early Christianity. He wrote, For we have not an innumerable multitude of books among us, disagreeing from and contradicting one another, as the Greeks have, but only twenty-two books which contain all the records of all the past times which are justly believed to be divine and of them five belong to Moses, which contain his law and the traditions of the origin of mankind till his death. The prophets who were after Moses wrote down what was done in their times in 13 books. The remaining four books contain hymns to God and precepts for the conduct of human life. During the turbulent years of the first century AD, Josephus clearly recorded that a list of authoritative books were considered divinely inspired 
by the Jewish people. This observation of Josephus is of equal importance for the reader of the Bible today. What books should be included in the Bible as authoritative and divinely inspired? This question has haunted theologians and Bible scholars for over 2,000 years. It is the same question that confronts every person seeking truth. When we study the origins of the Bible, it isn't long before we encounter the word canon in reference to both the Old and New Testament. What is the canon of the Bible? The word canon comes from the Greek, meaning rule or measuring stick. The word was first used by the early Christian church to describe the collection of books considered authoritative. But the canon process predates Christianity by several hundred years. The Old Testament and the New Testament both experienced a canon process that gradually identified which books to be included in the Bible. It is this process that we will consider. The canon process for the Old Testament is a long 1,000 year journey filled with speculation and academic debate. The writing of the books included in the Old Testament are difficult to trace because some reach back to the dawn of alphabet writing. The information I present in this episode is subject to controversy and debate since the academic community is also wrestling with the authorship and origin of the Old Testament. The one thing I have noticed about the higher criticism debate concerning the Old Testament is that there is more politics and vainglory being sought than true science. With this in mind, let's begin. The doctrine of biblical inspiration and a defined canon process can clearly be found in the writings of the early patristic church fathers. But back into the history of Israel, we find writings that had divine authority and served the Israelite community as a rule of faith also. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. We see Moses reading the book of the covenant to his people, and they recognized that this book was authored by God and had divine authority. What is this book, and what do we call it today? The Book of the Covenant presented by Moses is called the Torah, or the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, and these books are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. According to tradition, the Torah was dictated by God to Moses in two different locations, these locations being Mount Sinai and the Wilderness Tabernacle. The general consensus among the large Jewish and Christian community is that Moses authored the Pentateuch, with the exception 
of the concluding verses of the book of Deuteronomy that records the death of Moses. Did Moses write the Pentateuch? Today, a large consortium of academic scholars teach that the Torah had multiple authors and its composition took several centuries. Among these scholars, it is believed that the stories of the Pentateuch were compiled from four different written sources known as the JEPD hypothesis. These academic scholars write that the Pentateuch took nearly six centuries to be compiled. Recent higher criticism debate concerning the authorship of the Pentateuch has exposed the weakness in the JEPD hypothesis, and the academic pendulum is swinging back to the traditional view of Moses being the author. Did Moses write every word in the Pentateuch? Probably not, but Moses and his influence can be seen throughout the first five books of the Old Testament. The date of authorship is just as confusing. Orthodox rabbis and conservative Old Testament scholars date the writing of the Pentateuch between 1312 BC and 1280 BC, but Liberal Old Testament scholars have tried to date authorship to a 600-year period culminating after the Jewish diaspora of the 6th century BC. The authorship and date of the Pentateuch is a highly heated controversial topic. Old Testament scholars and bibliographers are all over the place with theory and conjecture. One thing is vividly clear in this debate. There is more politics and anti-Jewish and Christian bias than true scientific research and study. How was the Pentateuch viewed in the Old Testament? Also, how did Jesus and the Apostle Paul view the Torah? The self-testimony of the Torah clearly establishes that the Pentateuch was written by Moses under the divine inspiration of Jehovah. Joshua also considered the books of Moses as the book of the law that all Israelites should obey. We also have Hilkai, the high priest, finding the books of Moses in a secluded spot in the temple, and he referred to these writings as the Law of the Lord. The remaining books of the Old Testament and the prophets uniformly view the books of Moses as their national law and the Holy Word of God. Please review the following scriptures. In the New Testament, we also have the same perception that Moses wrote the Torah and that the Torah was the Word of God. Jesus and John the Baptist strongly believed 
that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. while the Apostle Paul also believed the Torah was written by Moses. I devoted much time presenting the scriptural evidence for the traditional authorship of the Pentateuch, but this by far does not end the debate. Higher criticism will always doubt the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, but their hidden motives and biases can be easily discerned. Therefore, why trust their debates when we can't trust their science? We now enter the era of the prophets, a time when God revealed His will through anointed prophets. The Nevi'im, Hebrew for prophets, is the second main division of the Old Testament. This division contains two subgroups known as the former prophets and the latter prophets. The former prophets is comprised of the narrative books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, while the latter prophets division also has two sections that is comprised of the major prophets of the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and the twelve minor prophets. Even though the former prophets appear first in the Old Testament, there are some scholars who date portions of the former prophets to be written later than the latter prophets. We cannot ignore the influence the latter prophets have on the political and social activism outside of Judaism. But the writings of these prophets are sobering and speak right to the heart. The third section of the Hebrew Old Testament is known as the Hagiographa, Latin for writings. This section is also known as the Ketuvim in Hebrew. The writing section of the Old Testament has three subgroups known as the Poetic Books, the Five Megillot, and the other books. The Poetic Books are Psalms, Proverbs, and Job, while the Five Megillot are the Song of Songs, Book of Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and the Book of Esther. The other books are the books of Daniel, Chronicles, and the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. In regards to the dating of the Hagiographa, it is clearly evident that the books of Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah are of a late date of authorship. These three books all openly describe the Babylonian captivity and the subsequent restoration of Zion. It is interesting to note that the books of Daniel and Ezra are the only books in the Old Testament with significant portions written in Aramaic. The Levites instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites 
who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. These verses in the book of Nehemiah are very poignant. We see the Levites instructing the people in the law by reading from the book of the law of God. It is interesting to note that the Levites worked to make the law clear, and they also explained the readings to the people. Why would it be necessary to make clear the book of the law of God? Maybe we have a language problem. Something happened while the nation of Israel was in Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. The national language of Hebrew was slowly eroded by the common language of Aramaic. This language from the Tigris and Euphrates was the common everyday language of diplomacy, business, and social intercourse. It wasn't long before the captive Jewish community restricted the language of Hebrew to religion and worship, while the language of Aramaic became the common language. When the children of Israel returned from captivity, they came speaking Aramaic, while Hebrew was used only by the Levites and priests for religious worship. Now we have a problem. The common people could only speak Aramaic, while the Levites and priests were bilingual, speaking both Hebrew and Aramaic. The reason why the book of the law of God needed to be made clear to the people is the people couldn't speak, read, or write the Hebrew language. The Babylonian captivity weakened the religious structure of Israel because Jerusalem and the temple were burned out ruins and the royal library went missing. But during the administration of Nehemiah, the royal library was found and the priests began collecting books about the kings and prophets and the writings of David. With the discovery of this library, a revival in the study of the law of God began. But in order to allow the common people to understand the book of the law, the Torah needed to be translated from Hebrew into Aramaic. We are now at the origins of the Targums and the next step in the evolution of the Old Testament. The Targums also went through a slow process of translation. Ezra and his Levites probably translated a small portion of the Pentateuch, but other portions of the Hebrew law was added over the years of the Middle Iron Age. Initially, only the Pentateuch and the prophets were included in the Targum translations, but eventually the writings were also added to the canon of the Old Testament. According to tradition, the Old Testament was closed and restricted to the current 39 books at the councils of Jamna and Jabni on the Mediterranean coast near Joppa in 90 AD. The conquests of Alexander the Great caused the world to change because he spread the Greek culture into new territories. Often God will select unlikely people to fulfill his will. 
Alexander the Great was one of these people. The Lord used Alexander's love for culture and literature to spread a common language throughout the known world. The international use of Aramaic yielded to the rise of the Greek language that traveled with Alexander. As a result of these conquests, Koine Greek became the common language of communication between nations and peoples. In fact, the word Koine is translated common. One of the significant byproducts of the Greek Empire was the publication of the first phase of the Septuagint during the reign of Ptolemy Philadelphus in the city of Alexandria, Egypt. The legend of the origin of the Septuagint can be traced to a document called the Letter of Aristus, written prior to 110 BC. This document states that Demetrius, librarian to Ptolemy, was inspired by the clarity and wisdom of the Hebrew manuscripts, and he encouraged Ptolemy to initiate a translation into Greek. According to the legend, Ptolemy requested from Eleazar, the high priest in Jerusalem, a copy of the Hebrew scriptures and learned men who could translate the texts into Greek. The letter of Aristus records that Eleazar cooperated with Ptolemy Philadelphus and sent 72 Hebrew scholars, six scholars from each of the 12 tribes to complete the task. Most Bible historians today doubt the accuracy of the letter of Aristus due to its flowery exaltation of Jewish wisdom. The general consensus is that scholars from Alexandria, Egypt, probably translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek to service the Jewish population of their city. The Septuagint was published in stages from around 250 BC to approximately 50 BC, only about 50 years prior to the birth of Jesus Christ. When Christianity penetrated the world of the Greek-speaking Jews and Gentiles, the Septuagint was the Bible used for preaching the gospel. Most of the Old Testament quotations in the New Testament are taken from this Greek Bible. In fact, several of Jesus' scriptural quotes are derived from the Septuagint, and the author of the book of Hebrews also utilized this translation. The Septuagint is the first true and complete translation of the Old Testament. The Old Testament canon process recognized the following list as the authoritative books used for doctrine and instruction. One might think that the religious writings coming from the first and second temple time frame of the Old Testament era are the 39 books listed, but this is not the case. There exists another group of books called the Apocrypha that have survived from antiquity. But these books were rejected by the priests and scholars of the pre-Christian era as not being canonical and authoritative. With the inclusion of writings from the New Testament era, these works also became known as the pseudopigraphal writings. 
The following list is the Old Testament Apocrypha. Why were these books rejected? These books were rejected for the same reasons the accepted canon was authorized. It was authorship, date of composition, and subject context. The pseudopigrapha are considered false writings because authors use the names of Old Testament prophets and New Testament apostles to give their books credence. The Old Testament Apocrypha is questioned because these works were thought to have been written between 300 BC and 300 AD. The date of authorship also exposes the falsehood of these writings. How could prophets dead by hundreds of years have written these works? Today, we call these actions fraud and forgery. Some of these works also had a clear myth overtone and were rejected by the Old Testament scholastic community for their obvious departure from the subject and text of the authoritative Old Testament writings. Should this be the case, then why did these false writings survive to this present day? Many of these works survived from antiquity because they were included in the Greek Septuagint and also included by Jerome in his Latin translation of the Bible in the late 4th century. Many biblical scholars believe that the Old Testament canonized scriptures were finalized by the Rabbinical Council of Jamna in 90 AD. The writings of Josephus in Against Pion, dated 95 AD, also treated the Hebrew Bible as a closed canon when he said, No one has ventured either to add or to remove or to alter a syllable. During the formative years of the New Testament, the Apocrypha was interspersed among the canonical books, but the Apocrypha was clearly identified as not authoritative. For nearly 1,000 years, the canon of the Old Testament was settled until the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther, in 1534, relocated the Apocrypha to the back of the Bible he translated. This action inflamed the papacy of Rome because Luther challenged Jerome's Latin translation. In 1546, the Roman Catholic Church at the Council of Trent responded to Luther by including the Apocrypha in the list of canonical books authorized by Rome. This is why the Catholic Bible today contains the Apocrypha, while all Protestant Bibles do not include these works. Is the Old Testament history? Each archaeological digging season adds more evidence that the Old Testament does chronicle actual historical events. Sure, it's possible that embellishment occurred. It's also possible that our understanding of Old Testament history is restricted to the piecemeal fashion of discovery. I have followed theories 
coming from the archaeological community for several years. The one thing I have learned is that their theories are filtered through political and philosophical agendas. The hatred of the Bible is clearly evident in the academic community. Why would the academic community have such disdain for the Holy Scriptures? The Bible exposes their sinful excess, and the liberal academic community wants to live in a society where their sin is not exposed. The liberal community hates the Bible because tens of millions of people consider the Bible their moral foundation and compass. It is hard to manipulate such a large group of people who oppose the liberal plan for the world due to their faith in the Bible. Should you remove the Bible as the source of your morality, then what is the source of your moral compass? Each and every one of us must honestly answer this question.